Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. I'm John McCutcheon. Uh, I'm a software engineer on the Dart virtual machine. And later on today, I'll give a talk on the Dart programming language. But for now, I want to talk to you all about uh, creating games in HTML5. This talk is going to kind of cover everything um, from the basic tech stack and some frameworks to some kind of interesting uh, cutting edge uh, ideas of how to make HTML5 games really compelling. So let's get started. So there's a lot of success, success stories out there right now. Um, there's a, a 3D graphics and physics engine designed for making HTML5 games uh, produced by the Turbulence Company that makes some really high-tech stuff, a very advanced physics engine and rendering engine. And it's entirely open source so that you can go and grab it and start developing with it for free. Uh, Nickelodeon has made hundreds of HTML5 games and has a lot of active users on them. And recently, uh, as part of a push for HTML5 games, uh, the people behind Cut the Rope ported it to HTML5 and they have a really good kind of post-mortem of what it took to go from Objective-C, an iPhone uh, application, to a native HTML5 game and they seem to have had a very positive experience. So there's a few frameworks out there. I've already mentioned Turbulence, but an interesting one is uh, Impact.js, which allows you to develop um, an application once that will run on Android phones, iPhone, in browsers, everywhere. Um, and Impact is primarily used for 2D graphics development. So these are some frameworks that you might want to pick up instead of starting from scratch. So I want to talk about the tech stack. Um, you know, this, this talk is kind of taking anyone who doesn't know anything about HTML5 game development and bootstrapping you up. So it's really important to understand what's available to you as a developer. Um, and so this is it at a, a really high level. Um, along the top, we have different languages that you can access the HTML5 uh, APIs through, uh, JavaScript, Dart, uh, and on the right is Pinnacle, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, but HTML5, from a game developer's perspective, consists mostly of Canvas, WebGL, WebAudio, and some miscellaneous APIs, which I'll cover momentarily. So the canvas that's available in HTML5 is a 2D pixel storage buffer. Um, and this uh, has 32 bits per pixel of resolution. So this is a byte for red, green, blue, and alpha. It's, you can control how large of a buffer you use to render into with the width and the height properties. This is not how big it's displayed on the page. You can scale up your canvas to be full screen or as small as you want. But you have to be aware of that when you're kind of creating this, the resolution of the surface that your game will be rendered upon. Canvas offers two ways of interacting with the, the pixel data. Uh, you can issue 2D vector graphics operations uh, and, and kind of render in something like a SVG, PostScript, PDF rendering model. Uh, this allows you to have really, really crisp looking uh, graphics and shapes because everything's vectorized and it's regardless of how much zoom you have applied uh, the the lines are always anti-aliased nicely um, for uh, more of a, a direct approach you can actually get at the pixel data stored in the canvas uh, you can read it with get image data and this returns a typed array back to you and then you can actually alter the pixel color values directly and then when you're done, you can put image data, and that will update the data in the canvas element that's being displayed. So I want to take a quick second here to show you a canvas-based game. This has actually been written in uh, impact.js. Sorry about the screen resolution size. We're a little um, <clears throat> cramped here.
So you get the idea of the kind of uh, game that you can make just purely canvas based. And this is uh, built using impact.js, which has a level editor and a lot of other content creation utilities. So you can get yourself uh, to a game that of this caliber relatively quickly. Um, built on top of canvas is WebGL. Um, WebGL actually sits on top of a canvas element. Uh, and instead of getting the canvas rendering context, you get a WebGL rendering context. Right now, WebGL 1.0 is available in most browsers. It, it's just recently become available in IE 11. Before that, there was no WebGL available in, in, the, in Internet Explorer. So oh, WebGL 1.0 is a kind of lines up with OpenGL ES 2.0, which is kind of old. It's from 2007. So that's almost seven years old. It's, a, it, it's starting to feel a little out of date, but it's actually um, almost as capable in terms of the graphics that you can express as a PlayStation 3 or an Xbox 360. So despite it being seven years old, you can still make really compelling 3D content with WebGL 1.0. What's currently in development, though, is WebGL 2.0. And this is mirroring OpenGL ES 3.0, the specification that was just announced this past summer. So next year, when WebGL 2.0 becomes a little bit more stable and people can start experimenting with it, uh, you're going to get a lot of really cool features. And the graphics API is, is going to be very current. Um, I mean, cell phones are just now getting access to OpenGL ES 3.0 content. So you can see how close the uh, HTML5 platform is uh, aligning itself with native software development. Of course, the big question with WebGL is, what about mobile devices? When can you use WebGL on an Android device? Uh, and the answer is, uh, in Chrome 30 for Android, WebGL will be enabled by default for um, many devices. Today, though, you can go in and you can actually enable an experimental flag in Chrome on Android and get access to uh, a WebGL rendering context on the phone. So you can start development today knowing that going forward in time, WebGL will become more pervasive on mobile platforms. So there's also Web Audio, and this is how you play sounds. Uh, Web Audio is a really powerful audio playback engine. It has extremely low latency. You can actually schedule clips, and when you're making a video game, it's really important that when the bullet graphically hits the wall that the sound effect plays at that exact instant. If they're out of sync, the user experience is not the same. It's not as immersive uh, as, as it should be. Uh, but with Web Audio, you can actually schedule clips. So in your game logic, you know when the bullet is going to hit the wall or when the player is going to, when Mario is going to smash through the bricks, you can predict forward in time when that's going to occur and schedule the sound effect to happen then. So Web Audio is perfect for creating video games. It also has some really cool things like uh, filters and 3D positional effects. So you can actually, you know, move, as the player moves through the world, you can move the, the kind of virtual microphone that is hearing sounds that playing through your speakers with the player so that when an enemy is behind the player, they'll actually kind of hear it if they have a sophisticated enough stereo. And of course, it supports all the standard file formats. So miscellaneous APIs that are important for games are uh, the full screen API. And this allows you to take any element and actually have it own the entire uh, screen. Uh, and pointer lock. And this pointer lock is really important for first person shooters. And I've actually written a, an article on how to implement uh, Quake or Doom style uh, keyboard and mouse input in an HTML5 game using pointer lock. Something that will become more and more important as games on the web become more sophisticated is web workers. And web workers will actually allow you to farm off work that is computationally expensive and move it onto a separate thread that doesn't block the render process. By doing this, it will allow your game to continue to have 60 frames per second while doing work that might computationally take a long time in an isolated worker um, away from your render thread. So I said we talk a little bit about Pinnacle. Um, and Pinnacle is portable native client. So native client gives sandboxed native code execution. Um, so native client consists 
of a C and C++ compiler, so, and the native client SDK, which gives you standard Unix APIs. So if you have an application already written in C that runs on Mac OS or Linux, porting to native client is trivial. Um, all of the standard APIs that you expect a Unix operating system to present to you, they're available, they run, you can actually have POSIX threads, you can have sh a shared concurrent, a shared memory concurrent, uh, multi-threaded uh, execution environment, all running inside of the browser safely and securely. You get things like standard file I.O., uh, BSD sockets, you can open up a TCP connection and connect out to a server or have someone connect to you. Alongside of the C compiler and the native client SDK, there is the Pepper plugin API. And this actually exposes all of the HTML5 features that I've just talked about, like uh, WebGL and Canvas, and actually gives you a C++ interface to those features. So you can actually uh, leverage all of these things that are available to HTML5 in C. Uh, and of course, with native client, you get really close to native uh, CPU performance. And I've got a demo later on showing um, how you can actually bridge these two worlds and, and write a game that is partially written in JavaScript and partially written in native client and get some really exciting stuff out of it. <clears throat> so uh, for those of you who don't know, I come from the, the games industry. I used to work for PlayStation for many years. And probably the, the thing that game developers are obsessed the most with is performance. And you know you want 60 frames per second. You want to have the, your game run really smooth. So it's important that you know coming to the HTML5 uh, platform, game developers understand where some of the common performance traps are. So JavaScript lets you be really fast and loose with types. I mean, everything in JavaScript is an object, and you can manipulate it anytime you want. You can add a new property to an object in JavaScript. You can remove a property. You can do whatever you want, but your JavaScript execution engine, like V8 or SpiderMonkey, they really, really want you to be uh, as static as possible. So in the VM world, we call this modifying the shape of an object, meaning whenever you add or remove a property, you're kind of changing the way this object looks in terms of the memory layout. And JavaScript engines want a static shape. So if you see this code here on the wall, we have a, a player class, and inside the inside there, we add the x property, the y property, uh, health property, and then you know your code instantiates the player class. And then some point later on, indicated by this arrow here, someone some piece of code adds the items array to the player. The player now can hold items in its inventory, but the moment that happens the runtime undoes all of the code optimization that has occurred. And your game starts running slowly for a little while. It can recover, but if you do this enough, the JavaScript execution engine will just throw up its hands and say, this, this, the objects of this class change so frequently, I can't optimize for them. And at that point, your, the performance of your application is going to suffer greatly. Similarly, all method dispatch in JavaScript is done at runtime. Uh, but again, your JavaScript engine wants you to be as strict as possible to get the most performance. So inside the function tick object on the slide, you can see that a variable called obj is passed in, and then the tick method is invoked in it. And since JavaScript is duct typed, it, so long as obj can respond to tick, this code will execute. It's safe. It's great. But if there's many different types of objects being seen at that call site where the arrow is, the JavaScript engine again will say, OK, well, you know, at first it was just one type. Now it's a few types, and I'm OK with that. But then after four or five types, it's just going to give up. Because it's, it, it, the, the state of the world is so dynamic that the, the gains from optimizing are thrown away every time you de-optimize. <clears throat> A final performance trap that you should really be aware of with uh, HTML5 games is the cost of garbage collection. Every single time your game allocates memory, um, you know some examples are at the red arrow, calling new on a class, 
uh, using array literals or an object uh, map literal. These are memory allocations. Every single one of these brings your game closer and closer and closer to a pause. And when it's paused, nothing is happening. You, you could be in the middle of updating the player's state in the world, everything is frozen. A couple milliseconds tick by and you've dropped a frame and the experience isn't that great. There's also some less obvious <coughs> locations of memory al allocation. Um, if you have unoptimized code or code that you triggered a deoptimization, which we just talked about, um, just doing simple arithmetic, like adding numbers together or multiplying numbers together, every single one of those operations allocates memory. And by doing so, you're moving yourself closer to this GC, which is going to cause a hiccup in your, uh, in your game. So I want to talk a little bit about tools. Uh, there's a, a CPU profiler and a memory profiler uh, built into Chrome. And uh, I'm not going to talk about the memory profiler today, uh, but I will spend some time talking about different ways to profile uh, CPU usage in your game. Again, game development is often about squeezing out the last little bit of performance, so knowing the tools that are available to you uh, can really help you make a, a compelling game. So there are two primary ways of profiling CPU usage. The first is sampling, and the second is structural. So sampling is what happens when you go into Chrome DevTools and you go to profiling and you say, you know, collect a JavaScript CPU profile. That's doing sampling profiling. And I'm going to go into a little bit of detail about what exactly that is. Uh, where structural profiling is a bit harder to get to, but it can sometimes provide you with much more insightful information. And we'll see why. So sampling CPU profilers, what they do is at a fixed frequency, say once a millisecond, they pause your program. Instantaneously, they stop the program's execution, they unwind the call stack, they figure out where your code is, they record that, and then your application resumes execution again. So let's look at a, a little example here. So let's say that the code is executing inside bar, right? So the sample tick comes in, it pauses your application. So bar was called by foo, and foo was called by your main program. So the call stack you can see on the right, this is what's collected by a sampling profiler. So at this instant in time, this is what your program was up to. But there's a big assumption baked into this is that, you know, that, that sample, that instantaneous moment of looking at what your program is doing is actually representative of what your program is doing between the samples. So if we take a sample, and then a millisecond goes by, and the profiler takes another sample, and so on, and so on. You know, we have now four samples of what your program is doing. But what we don't have is what your program was doing between those samples. I mean, a millisecond is an eternity for a CPU. You can be doing a lot of things in a, in a, in a millisecond. And so this is kind of what sampling profilers miss out on. They don't know what you're doing between those sample ticks. So, a way to make sampling profiler, sample-based profiling more useful and more valuable to you as a developer is to let it run for a long period of time. Because by letting it run for a long period of time, you get this, this coarse average of what your game has been doing in that, across many, many frames. Of course, this doesn't help you diagnose spikes, but it does give you a very accurate picture of what's going on uh, in a broader sense. So when samples are processed after the sampling is done, there are two pieces of data that are extracted from uh, each sample. So the percentage of the first piece of data is the percentage of samples where the function was a leaf. That's like, you know, it's the top of the call stack. It's the thing that's executing right then. The second piece of data is, um, you know, percentage of samples where the function was just present in the call stack. So you can see here that um, the first type, exclusive time, is blue, bar, because it's at the top of the call stack. Underneath that uh, is foo, uh, which is inclusive. So foo was in the call stack, but it wasn't actually running at the moment of the sample. It's not actually doing any work. It's just waiting for bar to return, and then it will continue on with its execution. So these are the two th pieces of data that you get out of a sampling-based profiler. Just the percentage of samples that you were at the top 
or the percentage of samples where you were, where you were somewhere in the call stack. Co let's contrast sampling profilers with structural profilers. So in structural CPU profilers, functions are instrumented to record their entry and exit times. So if we look at this, we have this buffer here. So foo gets called by your main program. When we enter foo, we record the timestamp that foo was entered. Then we enter bar and we record that timestamp. Then we exit bar, now we're back in foo and we record the timestamp and then we exit foo and then we record the timestamp. So, you know, if you call foo, foo calls bar, bar returns, this is the data that you collect in a structural profiler. So after this data has been processed, there are three data points per function. Um, you get the actual amount of time, right? Like the sampling profiler gives you the number of samples, the number of times on that one millisecond interval that you were running, where a structure will actually give you exact timing information. Ha the inclusive time, how much time, including time spent in your children, were you executing? And then the exclusive time, which is how much time are you executing at the top of the call stack? This is actually how much time that function is using on the CPU. And unlike sampling profilers, you can actually get the exact call count. So you can know how many times a function was called, how much time each one of those function calls took. It's a much more detailed, high resolution uh, amount of data, but there's a cost because, you know, there's a lot more involved in gathering these timestamps and recording the entry and exit of every function where sampling profiles can just tick in. They can just go tick, 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 tick. It's very fast. So question becomes which one should you use? And the answer is both. You should typically start with a sampling based profiler and this will give you a broad overview of where you should, where you should be looking and then um, kind of like using breakpoints when you're debugging your software, you should go in and structurally profile or chunk, chunks of your code so that you can figure out exactly how long the slow parts are taking and where in particular when the, you know, let's say collision detection is slow. You want to figure out exactly why and where in your collision detection code the slowdown occurs. And that's where the structural profiling will help. So just as a summary in terms of the contrast, um, sampling gives you approximate time. I mean, you could kind of, you can ballpark it uh, with sampling, but structural gives you the exact amount of time that your code has been executing for. Similarly, structural profiling gives you the exact call count where sampling gives you a rough approximation. I mean, every sample that is taken that your function is executing, you know it was running, but you don't know if it ever returned or you know, between two samples if it was running the whole time. Structural profiling will tell you this. The great thing about sampling profiling is that the overhead is tiny. It's really, really small. You can almost do it for free. Um, where structural profiling, the overhead typically can be large. And if you, you know, insert these structural markers throughout your entire code base, you can drastically slow down your program, which is why I recommend using it kind of the way you use breakpoints, where you kind of, as you're searching for that needle in the haystack, you, you move them around and you insert them and remove them from your code. So how, I've already kind of covered this a little bit, but sampling profiling uh, in Chrome is just built in. You just go to the Profiles tab in, in the Developers tool and you can access it. Um, there are different ways to view the samples. There's heavy or the bottom-up view. Um, and these are functions by impact on performance. So these are like just like the, the most expensive, exclusive amount of time running. They're going to be at the top. There's also the tree, which just starts at main and lets you kind of fan out and see the whole flow of execution as it's occurred. You can also filter by selected functions. So if you kind of know that you only, you're only interested in uh, functions in you know, this class, you can actually kind of grep through all the profiling data and, and just see that. So to use structural profiling in Chrome, it's a little bit more involved, but I'm going to walk you through the process now. Um, there, if you open up a new tab and you go to Chrome colon tracing, uh, you get this, um, this internal profiler that's built to really profile the guts of Chrome. But you can access and ex export data from JavaScript into this, and this will give you uh, the structural profiling that I've been talking about. So the big trick here is that you actually have to go into your JavaScript code and instrument it by inserting console time and console time end 
function calls. Um, so inside foo, you can see that there's console time foo, console time and foo, similarly in bar. The overhead of these macros is tiny when Chrome tracing is not on. So you can, in some circumstances, just leave them in without a noticeable performance impact. But when Chrome tracing is on, that's when they actually get evaluated and the data is collected and then the performance impact can be larger. So it's important to understand that structural profiling can kind of skew the performance uh, characteristics of your program. So once you've gone in and you've inserted the console time, time ends throughout your code, you then go over to Chrome tracing and you start recording. You go back to your, your tab, you interact with it, you, you run the game for the while, then you go back and you press stop. And then you can inspect the Chrome tracing timeline and how you do that is, a, is kind of beyond the scope of this talk, um, but there are many articles and I've given uh, talks in the past that go into much more detail about how you can actually um, inspect the, the timeline. But the most important thing when it comes to performance in your game is that you should actually have a budget. Um, so before you go and start writing your game, you should try and divvy up the 16 milliseconds that you have for your frame to various subsystems. Maybe three milliseconds for AI, five milliseconds to draw, you know, two milliseconds for the player movement or something like that. You should know how much time you want to devote to each system before you start development. And you should track this over time. Like I said, at the beginning of the talk, I work on the, the Dart VM, and we have, a, we have bots that after every single commit we make, the bots go out and they actually run a bunch of benchmarks. And they will tell you, you know, you increase the speed of this benchmark by 2%, or you decrease the speed of this chunk of code by 20%. And, you know, this is graphed over time, so you make a commit and you can go in and you can actually confirm that not only have you not regressed to the performance of your game, but that you've increased it the way you expect to. And you can see this continued over time. So if you really are serious about performance, investing in something like this might seem a bit heavy up front, but it really does pay dividends in the end. Now I want to talk uh, about portable native client acceleration modules. So what if you could have, um, you know, 90% of your application written in JavaScript, written in just, you know, just the DOM, just JS, but like 10% of your application where the, where the CPU performance really matters could be written in C and C++. This is what native client acceleration modules gives you. It allows you to extend JavaScript or Dart with C++. So NACL works like this. You feed C++ code into the NACL compiler, and the output of this is the NACL exe and a manifest file. You insert a single tag inside your HTML, which references that manifest, and then boom, you've, your, your native client application is actually executing inside that tag at close to native speed. So NACL gives you a secure C++ runtime for the web. Uh, existing C and C++ code works. There are people who have successfully run C Sharp code under the NACL uh, sandbox. And you can, as discussed, you can interact with the browser through the Pepper API and get access to 3D graphics and all of the great stuff that's available in HTML5. But it requires that the entire application be written in C. That's, a, that's kind of the classic NACL story, but we can leverage NACL as an acceleration framework, just kind of how you leverage your GPU to draw really fast 3D graphics. You can leverage NACL to do the computation for you very quickly. <clears throat> so the questions are, you know, can we provide the native performance where it counts? Because if you look at it, most applications, there's only a few places where performance really matters. The rest of it, you know, it's fast enough, you'll never slow it down. But code where you're executing in a loop, or you're doing a lot of computation, that's where you want the native performance. And that's what native client acceleration modules give you. So at a really high level, it kind of works like this. By passing messages via post message, 
between the NACL uh, module and uh, the JavaScript world, the, your, your render process, uh, you can kind of send work to C++, have it, the work execute there, and then when the work is done, you'll get a message back giving you the, the, you know, the, the result. So how do you build this? Well, you take an existing C++ library, or you write a new one, um, and then you expose, uh, you put an interface on top of that library that's built around message passing. It's built around the idea of asynchronous computation where you, you know, you're delivered a bundle that you're expected to do some work with, and then later on, asynchronously, you, you reply with the result. So that kind of requires some, a bit of a work queue on the C++ side. I have some code on GitHub that uh, makes this very straightforward to, to do. Um, and then the final step is that you write the kind of the mirror of the, the C++ message passing API in JavaScript or Dart so that you, know, you, you have a, an API that's available to your script that says, okay, go and do some work over in, in native land. And then when that native land is done, call this callback, just like an on-click or something like that uh, when the work is finished. So I ported the bullet physics engine uh, to native client acceleration modules. It took about a day. Um, it, it, was, it was very straightforward. Um, so in terms of consumption of a, let's say you, you, know, you went and downloaded my bullet physics acceleration module, you really just have to add a script tag to get the interface to it and then add the embed tag. The cool thing about native client acceleration modules is that they actually don't take any space up for rendering. They're invisible. They're just kind of like this background workhorse that you can call into and have it do some work and come out. So it's really as simple as using something like jQuery. So some example uh, applications for it would be like bullet physics simulating hundreds of rigid bodies, you know, blazing fast zip decompression, video encoding and processing, image processing, any th these are examples of algorithms where you really need computational power that is not always available in JavaScript. But by using an acceleration module, you can leverage native performance where it really matters. <clears throat> so this is a graph of you know, how many times can, I, can you send a message to a native client acceleration module and get a reply within five seconds. Um, the x-axis is how large of a message it is, so starting at 16 bytes and going all the way up to 16 megs. Um, so you can see that it, the drop-off starts uh, around 4K message size. And 4K is actually, it's a reasonable uh, amount of data to transmit across the wire. Um, and it, you know, continues to go down. Um, but what's really interesting is that even at 256K per message, the round trip is only a millisecond. So, and this is asynchronous, so your JavaScript is executing code as this millisecond ticks across. So at the beginning of your frame, you can go and send a few messages. The native client acceleration module can do the computation, and then you'll get the call back later on uh, before your frame is done. So in terms of throughput, uh, kind of the opposite shape of the graph, as the message size gets bigger, you get more data through this pipe. Uh, and it peaks at around 420 megabytes per second um, if you're sending about a one megabyte uh, frame of data. So <clears throat> native client acceleration modules also allow for multiple acceleration modules to be used on the same page. You're not just limited to one. You could have many. I have an example application where I have a compressor and a decompressor. So I can send something to the compressor, get the compressed data back, send it over to the decompressor, and get the same data back that I had originally. And this is all within the same page. It offers really low latency and high throughput. To give you some context to these numbers, let's say you wanted to stream 1080p video at 60 hertz. It's only 240 megabytes per second, which is 60% of the bandwidth that you have available. And if you were to do this, the, the latency on these requests is only eight milliseconds. So it's very uh, practical. Um, like the throughput and the latency are well within acceptable means. You know, and also think about f physically simulating a thousand rigid bodies. Um, you only need seven megs uh, of data per frame, and that's only 1.7% of the bandwidth. So you could be doing 
video streaming and physics simulation and still have lots of bandwidth available to you and the latency would be very reasonable. So I want to pause right here and uh, actually show you uh, a native client acceleration module in action. So here's a stack of uh, like Jenga blocks, um, you know, 20 high. And I can pick up a block and interact with it. What you're seeing um, here is what the simulation time is. So right now the simulation for this entire physics scene um, is a couple hundred microseconds. It's super fast because it's running in native C. But the graphics that you're seeing, I'm just using 3JS. The native client acceleration module is doing all of the work and it's just sending the transformation matrices back across the wire. So I mean we could do 400 random cubes, 400 random cylinders, just some random shapes. It doesn't matter. It's extremely fast because it's actually running C code and just transmitting the transformation matrices back every frame. So let's look at uh, the performance of the uh, NACL acceleration module versus uh, machine translated JavaScript, like in Scripten, Asm.js, something like that, right? So uh, what we're seeing here, um, the y-axis is the microseconds to compute the frame. Uh, the, gr the blue line is the NACL acceleration module time, and the red line is the JavaScript execution time. You might be wondering, where is the blue line? Um, <laughs> it's that fast that it's so low on that graph. So let's, let's zoom in. Um, well, actually, before we do that, it's important to note, like, look at how spiky the JavaScript execution is. It's really all over the place. It's very important with a game that you have consistent performance every frame. You want it to be the same. You want to see a flat line there. But you have these bizarre spikes. Probably de-optimizations have occurred. And then the engine recovers, and then another de-optimization occurs. So if we zoom in, look at how smooth and flat and also how low the NACL acceleration module computation time is versus JavaScript. Now what about uh, compressing? Let's say you wanted to use the gzip uh, algorithm to do some compression. Again, red is uh, JavaScript and blue is a NACL acceleration module. You can see the performance difference is huge, and again, the performance of NACL code is very stable, um, which is always attractive. Look at how bumpy that is. Uh, similarly with decompression timing, um, so fewer data points here, but same story holds. Really inconsistent JavaScript uh, execution performance, very stable native performance. And you can pass the data back and forth between these two worlds asynchronously without interrupting your JavaScript's execution. So NACL acceleration modules are at least an order of magnitude faster than, than machine translated JavaScript code. And they offer consistent performance. These are both very uh, attractive qualities to game developers. So you might have some concerns like, NACL is only available in Chrome, right? So if you, you want to make a, an application built around this, well, maybe you're restricted to just Chrome. Um, uh, but I know I've been kind of s demonstrating how much better native client performs than machine translated JavaScript, but at least you can have a polyfill where your application will run um, in browsers that don't support native client. Not at the great performance that you've seen, but they still run. Um, also, applications that require uh, many back and forth messages with uh, a lot of chatter back and forth, like NACL can't make progress without hearing back from JavaScript and, and vice versa. Uh, that's, this is not good for native client acceleration modules. You really want something where you can pass some work across and then continue on. But if you need to kind of synchronously be chattering back and forth, you're not going to see as large of a performance win. So it's really ideal for applications that are heavily uh, HTML5 based with like kind of like 10% native code execution. 
NACL acceleration modules are going to allow us to bring new types of applications to the web. It's going to allow us to keep the, the flexibility and the productivity of working in a language like JavaScript, but keep uh, great performance that you get from native code where you really need it. And the usage, if you are a web developer that is consuming an acceleration module, it's really straightforward. You just include a script tag and an embed tag, and you're done. You make the calls, and it feels like JavaScript. So this morning, uh, Eric Beidelman talked to you all about Polymer, which is really exciting. I think Polymer is one of the most exciting pieces of technology on the web. Um, that's right. Wooer. Um, but so I've been playing with the idea of why not make an entire 3D graphics engine built out of custom elements? Why, uh, have to, why do we have to write WebGL JavaScript code to create 3D scenes? Why can't we just create a new set of elements that express a 3D scene in HTML? And I just want to give a, a quick demo. It's very early, um, but it's kind of cool. So this is like a, a rough sketch of kind of what it would look like, right? Like you would have game app, game player, game stage, game static mesh. All of these things are kind of expressing these really high level concepts that are meaningful to your game, but it's just in pure HTML. So let me switch over uh, to the Dart editor and show you a quick demo here. This is alpha level software, so please be forgiving if any, you know, any glitches occur. So this is a really uh, kind of simple scene here. We have like this, this green arc is spinning. We've got this plane rotating in the ground. This is expressed entirely in HTML. They're, the only bit of code, and I'll show you in a moment, is just to animate the properties. But let me show you what you could do in a world like this. Oops. So if we were to open up Chrome DevTools and go over to the Elements pane, we can expand and we can say, OK, OK, so here's our scene tag, right? And then we have an axis align bounding box. There's that arc with the green color. And there's its start and end angle as it's rotating. It's updating right in the elements pane. Um, but let's just go down here and say, what if we just edited the HTML and did this? There, we've just added a yellow 3D sphere to the scene just by adding the HTML. We can you know, go in and maybe change the, the radius to be five. And there, it's shrunk. So imagine where you could create a 3D graphics world expressed entirely in HTML with custom elements. This, to me, is an example of like, how powerful Polymer is. A lot of the way people talk about Polymer right now is kind of encapsulating a bunch of divs. But you can actually take Polymer to a totally different level and kind of use it to create really complicated uh, applications with tags that kind of are meaningless in a strictly HTML world. Uh, as a final little demo here, I'll show you a A simple Minecraft-like world. Again, it's all just HTML at this point. So the tags here are just, you know, transform tags and, and draw this mesh and use this texture. I mean, you can write a WebGL application without writing any code. You just have a texture tag, and you give it a, a source, just like an image tag. And it's going to go and fetch that and upload it into a WebGL texture for you. So that's kind of, it, it's an interesting um, 
use of Polymer, I think. Um, so hopefully people will, will start experimenting with Polymer in this way. Um, and I hope to have more impressive demos as things uh, mature. So I left PlayStation and I joined Google because I really believe strongly that the web and HTML5 games are the future of gaming. Uh, the, the technology that's available inside browsers is so powerful today. It's kind of amazing that we take for granted that within a web browser you have the same capabilities that you have within a PlayStation 3 or an Xbox 360. To me that's really exciting because the web is so dynamic and flexible and everything happens so quickly there and everyone has a web browser. So I personally believe that you know, HTML5 games are the future of gaming and I hope that you guys all create really awesome games going forward. Thank you. <laughs>